everyone. We're going to get started. Um, you know, we can feel free to pass around the sign in for those who just came in. Um, please sign in um, with the name and email address so I can email you notes from what we'll talk about today and pictures of any exercises we discuss. Um, so please make it legible if you can. Um, I have bad handwriting too, but um, you know, I appreciate it. Um, but in there, can you sign in here too? Either way, one or the other. Um, so I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm a physical therapist and a certified bike fitter. Uh, I own Cape Cod BeFit and Bike Fit, and I have the pleasure of helping Cape Codders stay active through physical therapy, uh, performance training, and bike fitting. Um, my practice is a little different than most on the Cape, and uh, I structure my schedule to allow clients to get in immediately. Um, if someone calls me, I do a phone consultation with them same day um, in most cases. And then we get started that same week. Um, I really have been a physical therapist for a long time. And I think having to wait six to eight weeks to start care is um, not acceptable. Um, so that's why I started my own business. And um, it's really great to see um, how quickly I can get people better when I can see them immediately after um, they injure themselves. Uh, the other thing that I like to do in my practice is work uh, with clients on injury prevention. Uh, I love to see people and work on um, a few things to keep them from needing um, a formal physical therapy. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, um, how to keep yourself healthy on the pickleball court. Um, I started playing pickleball, I think a few years ago now, and I just um, probably like most of you immediately just fell in love with it. And um, it's just a great game. It's, um, but it's uh, growing in popularity. It's also growing in the rate of injury. Um, so I'm glad you're all here investing some time and learning how to uh, keep yourself healthy. Um, so let's see if I can advance my slides here. There we go. Um, so um, like I said, my business is Cape Cod BeFit and BikeFit. Um, I also uh, lead a group called Cape Cod Active Women. Um, we started as just a Facebook group. Now, now we have a website uh, we just launched this year. Um, I basically organize uh, events throughout the Cape for women to get together and have fun. Um, we're a very um, casual group. We do hikes, bike rides, rock climbing, uh, kayaking. We have a group that meets at the Marston's Mills Pickleball Courts um, each week. The night is kind of up in the air this time of year, and usually we try to settle on a night once um, the weather is a little more predictable. Um, so if you're not already a member, feel free to join us. Uh, you can join us on Facebook or capecodactivewomen.com. Um, we'd love to have you join us. So um, pickleball, um, like I said, it's one of the fastest growing um, recreational activities right now. Uh, and the rate of uh, emergency room visits is astronomical. Um, a lot of uh, folks find pickleball very easy to pick up. You can, you know, within a day, you can pick up a paddle, learn to play, and, you know, go about your business. Um, the downside is because you can learn so quickly, your body doesn't have a chance to catch up and also learn um, how to play pickleball, if you will. So, um, you know, as you know, there's a lot of cutting and quick movements. Um, and if you haven't adequately prepared your body for that, um, it's a recipe for um, an injury. So um, I don't know about you, but when I'm on the pickleball court, I oftentimes hear conversations like this, everyone comparing notes about what hurts and um, you know what kind of race they're trying. Um, so, um, or you know who their uh, partner was that's out because you know, they're looking for someone else. So um, hopefully um, we can spread the word about doing a little bit of prep work uh, so that you know, we can all be like this happy guy, um, second from the left, just um, enjoying the sport for what it is. So this is not an exhaustive list of injuries, but these are the most common list of pickleball injuries. Uh, it's quite long. Um, a lot of them um, can be prevented with the right, the right work ahead of time. Um, and they all basically fall into four main categories of injuries. So you have your tendonitis, tissue rupture, ball-related injuries, and sprains and strains. So these are the big ones um, that um, take up most of this list here. So I think um, tendonitis is a word that just kind of gets thrown around and no one really ever tells anyone what it is. 
Um, tendonitis is basically um, an overuse injury to your tendon. So you're using something too much, too soon, um, or without adequate prep. And you're creating an inflammatory process within that tissue. Um, if it's not addressed, it will progress um, and unfortunately um, can weaken the tissues or just keep you off the court. It'll be, become a painful um, and more chronic condition. Um, so you can't see my nice graphic because of the bottom here, but that's okay. Um, basically just, you know, reiterating that you're in the right spot. You're starting, um, to address, um, you know, all the prep work. Um, you're not waiting until you can't play anymore to, to take some steps to prevent injury. Um, so there are really, in my mind, four big pillars of, um, uh, physical, attributes you need to be a healthy pickleball player. You need the strength, um, you need flexibility. You also need mobility in your joints and stability. Um, and I would also say you need some agility. So your ability to move left to right, front to back um, and balance. And balance is really important and often overlooked. So here are just some little shadow figures of some common um, movements you may see in pickleball. And I put this up here because um, I just want to, to, you know, to think about how many of these movements are things that you're doing in your everyday life? I'm guessing probably not a lot of them. Um, so to think that, you know, you just pick up a paddle, you go to the court and suddenly you can do what this lower left person is doing. Um, it's quite a, a difference from probably your daily activities. Um, so what we need to do to get the body ready is um, a little um, warm up routine and make sure that um, you have addressed some of these bullet points here. Um, so I'll go into a little more depth about all of these, but uh, wearing court shoes is important. Staying hydrated, I think that one gets forgotten um, sometimes. Performing an active warm up, and we'll go over that today. Um, performing sport specific strengthening exercises, stretching after activity, and then listening to your body, not your ego. Um, so that's a tough one, too. Um, if you feel like it's enough, it's probably enough, or probably more than enough, actually. Um, so, court shoes. Um, a lot of folks who are just starting out don't start out by going to buy some court shoes, they're wearing running sneakers. Um, and so the shoe on the bottom left is a court shoe, upper right is a running shoe, and you can see there's a big difference in the tread there. Um, the running shoe is too grippy and will definitely um, lead to an ankle sprain. So um, I'm all for, you know, trying out the sport before you get all the equipment, but um, you just have to be careful if you're doing a lot of cutting left to right um, you don't want to be doing it with a running shoe. I would pick whatever sneaker you have that has the least amount of tread on the bottom. Um, and then as soon as you feel like you're committed to the sport, get into a court shoe that so you have the ability to move left to right um, without really having that grip stop you and roll your ankle to the side. Um, so hydration. Um, I think pretty much everyone works on this. Uh, or has to work on it, myself included. Um, but things that we don't often think about is that staying hydrated actually helps to improve the elasticity of your tissues. So your tissues will, your muscles will stretch a lot easier if they're if you're hydrated. Um, being hydrated also lubricates your joints. So your knees might not feel as creaky and cracky um, if you've had enough water before um, activity. Um, improved tissue healing. So if you're more hydrated, all the things that you need um, to come overcome an injury um, are able to get to the tissues easier. Um, and then decrease soreness because you're able to flush out um, all the things that cause soreness in your muscles. So definitely um, bring a water bottle or two with you to the pickleball court. And I'd say drink half that on the way to the court. That way you start um, and you're hydrated. So um, I wanted to go over this warm up. There are a lot of things on here. Um, so we'll go over two scenarios. 
Um, first scenario is you get to the court and there's a long wait to play. Um, in that case, perhaps you utilize the time to do these things. Um, if you get to the court and you have to play pretty quickly, we'll whittle it down to, let me see how many I picked here, an abbreviated version so that you can just quickly at least get a few things moving around. Yeah, the ex express, I called it, five things that you can do to just quickly get warmed up. Um, that way you're not starting cold. Um, so you can do these activities with a paddle. You can do them without a paddle. Um, I say if you're at the court, why not do it with a paddle? Um, I'd say 10 to 20 reps on each side is usually enough to get you warmed up. Um, and um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Hmm, it escapes me. It'll come back. Um, so I'll show you these movements. Um, start slow slow movements, small movements, and then you increase the speed and increase the size of the movements. Um, so the first thing um, is just shoulder circles. So doing some of these nice and slow, small, you do them back, you do them forward. Um, and then as you get going, the speed increases, uh, the size increases um, forward and back. And both sides, 10 to 20 on each side, um, just to get you, uh, your shoulders warmed up. Next thing, book openers. So you're envisioning um, that your arms are the, the front and back of a book. So you're opening the book on one side, opening on the other. Your eyes follow your fingertips or your paddle. Um, that way you're rotating your neck and your back. Um, I'm trying to keep my hips and pelvis pointing straight forward so that my trunk is rotating a little bit more. Again, I'm gonna start maybe with a small range of motion. And then as I get into it, I'm going to reach farther and farther behind me. The amount of mobility you have, um, it's different for everyone. So start where you need to start um, and push to you know wherever you need to push so that you feel like you're getting a gentle stretch. All of you should feel gentle. Um, don't feel like you have to necessarily increase the, the speed or the amount of stretch um, past what you're comfortable with. Um, so the next thing, um, I don't really know what else to call this other than disco because you're just gonna come up this way. Um, so I'm gonna start by doing it with minimal trunk rotation. And then by the time I'm done with my 10 to 20, I'm really reaching back, um, trying to get a little bit um, and even wrist extension in the back here. Um, so that's my, my disco shoulder flexion. Um, so both sides. I always say, just I would say in the interest of time, do it with your dominant side. If you have the time, why not do it on the other side? But if you're trying to get through this extensive list, go through it with your dominant side first. Um, the forehand backhand is just um, coming down like this and doing an X. Uh, again, you're starting with a small X, and then over time, you're increasing the size of the X. If you want to also warm up your legs a little bit, um, you can think about just coming down to the side and then down to the other side. So sort of doing a little bit of a side lunge, but that's also included later. So don't feel like you have to um, incorporate that. Um, so there's your X move. Um, squats doesn't have to be the deepest squat that you've ever done. Um, I call them air squats. So you're literally, literally just doing this, just warming up your quads 10 to 20 times. Maybe as you get into it, you go a little bit lower as you go. Um, we're just trying to get those muscles ready to work for you on the court. Um, the other thing is a lunge. So just coming forward, a little push off. Doesn't have to be really deep. Um, I would say alternate um, 10 to 20 on each side, coming out pretty straight in front. Um, you know, that's the, the perfect world is that this is how you get to a shot. Usually it's, you know, not that ideal, but we'll get warmed up in that fashion anyways. And then next on the list, the lateral lunge. So just coming to the side. Um, as you get into it, you can make it a little more plyometric by pushing off the foot that you're bringing out to the side. Um, so that's a nice way to get your, your legs warmed up too. Hip swings. Um, I'd hold on to something, maybe, you know, the fence at the court. You're just literally kind of doing a diagonal kick. Um, you can also do a front to back kick. 
Scale raises, this is a really important one. Um, so just getting your calves warmed up, um, tearing your Achilles tendon is a really common knuckle ball injury. So you definitely want to warm up the calves before you get going. That's in the express workout for sure. So 10 to 20 of those. And then I would also say, if you have the time, do some single leg. Uh, maybe 10 on each side there. Um, lateral slide um, is more or less um, a lateral lunge, just like a little little hop side to side. Doesn't have to be a big hop. If you want, as you go, maybe you progress to um, a farther distance between your hops. But we're just getting the outside of your ankle and the outside of your hip ready to um, to protect you and to stabilize if you do um, a side-to-side -side shift. Um, the other thing, and the last thing on the song list is doing a similar thing front to back. So you're jumping forward, coming back. So just a little movement here, almost like you're taking a long step. Um, and then, you know, maybe 10 or so on each side here. Um, all together, if you, once you know this program, you can probably do it in five minutes or so. Um, but, you know, if you don't have that time, let me see what I wrote down for the express here. So of these, um, we would do the, still do the shoulder circles. We would do the book openers, get your, your <clears throat> arms and your back loosened up, um, the squats, the lunges, and the heel raises. So those movements should be enough to hit the key places uh, before you hop on the court. Um, and really the goal of a warm-up is just that. You should feel that your body temperature has increased after you do these movements. If you don't feel that, you probably need to go back and do another set. Um, the reason we want your body temperature to increase is because if your tissues are warmer, they're more extensible. So they stretch easier. Um, and that's that's the ultimate goal is that when you're you know making a move or reaching for a shot, your tissues are able to get you there without um, too much force. Um, so that's that's kind of literally we're we're warming up the tissues. So um, I'm guilty of this. You know, you play and play and play, and then it's time to go. And you hop in the car and you go home um, without stretching. And then, especially early in the season, the next day, you're like, gosh, why do my legs feel so bad? And it's because I didn't take the time to stretch after. Um, so you need to be kind to your legs. You want to basically stretch all those muscles that we were warming up before. So here are some nice stretches to do for your legs. I would say the top one is probably the top priority. So that's your calf stretch, um, literally a runner stretch. So you're here, your heel is down, your knee is straight. You're just bringing yourself forward until you feel a stretch in your calf. I like to do them with my knee straight and then also with my knee bent. There are two muscles in your calf and they sit on top of each other. One stretches when the knee is straight, the other with the knee bent. So um, I'd say in general with stretches, a good place to aim for is two for 30 seconds or one for 60 seconds. You certainly do more and you can certainly do less. So you have to fill out what works best for you based on where you are. Um, hamstring stretch is just putting the leg out in front, knee is straight, back is straight, and then leaning forward. If there's a bench where you are, you can throw your foot up on the bench. And then same thing, back straight, lean forward. Um, I think um, you know, through sports and things, a lot of us learned that this was the best way to do a hamstring stretch. Um, you can actually do a much more effective stretch if you're in a good posture and positioning with your back and bend forward that way instead. Um, Quad stretch, this is the one that most people know and love. So just grabbing your ankle. Um, if you can, I'd say you even want to extend your hip a little bit 
So try to bring your leg back a little bit and that should give you a pretty good stretch there. Um, and then the other one is your hip adductor. So these muscles here, and then you can just do just a little hip shift and that should stretch that inner thigh. Um, once you get into the program and you learn it, you can probably actually do um, an arm stretch while you're stretching this. So you check off two boxes at the same time. Um, so upper body stretches, uh, a back stretch that I like um, after pickleball is uh, like a modified child's pose for those of you who are familiar with yoga. Um, I would hold on to you know, a bench or a fence or something like that. And then you just kind of sit back like this so that you're stretching kind of your upper back. You may feel it all the way down to your lower back. If you move your hands to the left, you'll probably feel it more on the right side. If you move your hands to the right, you'll probably feel it more on the left side. Um, chest and biceps is essentially what this girl in the red is doing. So arms behind your back, pulling your shoulders back and straightening your elbows. Um, this is a great one. I, this one, I think probably everyone would benefit from. It's to kind of counteract what we all naturally do to ourselves by being on our phones and our computers. Um, so just bringing your shoulders back and you know, 30 to 60 seconds is a great target for that. Um, neck stretching, the one I like for that, is just pulling your head to the side, nice and gentle. Try to relax your shoulder on that side. Nice gentle pull. 30 seconds is a great goal. If that's too much, maybe you start with 15. Um, if you're really tight, you might not even need to apply the overpressure with your hand. You may just be able to come to the side this way and feel a stretch, and that's fine too. I have a quick question. When you say 30, 60 seconds, you're talking about just holding that position, not coming in and out of it mm -hmm. several times. Yeah, just a static hold. So um, before activity, you want to kind of go through your movements quickly. So um, very dynamic. After um, a long load, low duration hold. So um, a gentle stretch, longer amount of time, because um, we're actually working on um, lengthening those tissues. Um, other things, especially for paddle and racket sports, is to stretch your, your elbows and your wrist. Um, elbows straight, just gently bringing your hand down this way, um, and then flipping over and pulling down this way. So that will um, help you to prevent the, the tennis or the golfer's elbow and under common culprits. Um, from a strengthening standpoint, these are the, the three main areas to focus on in your workouts. So core stability, you don't have a strong, stable core, nothing outside of that is going to be strong. So start start in your core. Um, from there, hip strength and stability, um, really important, and then shoulder strength and stability. And those, you know, are probably tied for second, but definitely start with your core. Um, so those are, there's that. Um, so uh, today we went over the active warm up, went over the stretches to do after. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions anyone has, um, but um, something that I offer kind of on that preventative um, realm that I was talking about is I do a pickleball performance analysis um, with folks. So it's an hour long appointment, come into the office. We look at those four pillars that we talked about before. So strength, mobility, flexibility, and stability in all of the important places that you need it to play pickleball. Um, and then from there, we leave with a lot of great information about what you need to work on um, and maybe what you don't need to work on as well. Um, and as a thank you for coming to the workshop, I'll give you $50 off if you decide to, to move forward with that. Um, my contact information is down here. Um, can't see the website, but it's capecodbfit.com. Um, feel free to email me with any questions. I'm um, happy to, to answer that for you. Um, does anyone have any questions um, about anything that we went over? Um, one of the most common issues like people with uh, 
yeah. lower back pain. Mm -hmm. um, one, how to prevent it, and two, how do you stretch that with the squats? How do you? So um, back pain is multifaceted, um, so it's kind of tricky, but um, the big thing is to make sure you have a nice, strong, stable mm -hmm. core um, and to make sure you have nice, strong, stable hips. Um, so a lot of strengthening that way from a stretching perspective. Um, you want to make sure that your leg muscles are nice and loose. So that would be um, the hamstring stretch, the quad stretch. If those muscles are tight, uh, like in most folks, their hamstrings are tight. Your hamstrings actually attach to your pelvis, so they'll pull your back into a bad position if they're tight. So you really want to make sure that you have good flexibility in your legs so it's not pulling your back in a funny um, position while you're playing. Um, so I would say get on a good stretching routine, start doing some core strength. Um, that way you have a nice support for your back. Um, and then, of course, the active warm-up that we want to pretend. <laughs> yes. I, I missed the first time. I don't know if you addressed balance at all. Um, if you did, my apologies. If you didn't, could you go over a few preliminary balance exercises we could do also? Yeah, um, balance, I didn't really go into too much, but I did um, mention it as just an important aspect of pickleball. And depending on your particular level of balance, standing on one foot is great. If I'm at the court, you know, maybe I'm bouncing a ball standing on one foot. Um, balance gets harder if you are doing more things at the same time. So maybe you're bouncing on one foot, talking to your friend and bouncing a ball. Um, uh, and, and juggling chainsaws, but um, you know, and then from there, <laughs> yeah, you close your eyes. So we use our visual input a lot for balance, which is why people have a lot of trouble in the dark. Um, so you can close your eyes. You can also um, challenge your visual input by just looking around. Um, I tell my clients just to pretend they're crossing the street, and um, folks are often surprised at how bad their balance is when they're just moving their head left to right. Um, so those are all quick and easy things you can do kind of court side. Um, other things that people like to do are get like squishy mats to stand on, that's great. Um, there are balance boards that kind of have a little bit like a rocker board so that you work on weight shift and stabilizing. Um, those are really nice tools to use too. Um, but those would be the things I would start with. Yes. If you're coming back from an injury, say an Achilles, is there some any specific how you would come back if you haven't gotten on the court since you had that incident, uh, but you remain physically active? Um, is there anything once you go to the court that you should think about or do? Well, I'm the type of person where in the moment I am not going to be able to limit my, you know, how I move on the court. And I know that about myself. So I know that if I were to be in that situation, I would need to know that I could jump and do all the things um, because I'm not gonna be able to stop myself. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the uh, coming back from that injury, jumping is probably the hardest. Um, so if you're able to just go and um, practice, maybe in a low key, relaxed setting with some friends, just kind of getting used to the feel of how you move on the court. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, as you're, depending on how your rehab is or where you are with that, um, jumping may be something that is not on the table for you at that point, or maybe something that you have to work on a little bit to kind of get to a place where you feel confident that you could do that. And it's um, oftentimes not the actual jump, it's the landing from the jump that's the most important part. So, you know, practicing things like that, leading up to actually getting back on the court. Um, but yeah, I think if you can get out and do some, um, just some, you know, light volleying or, you know, whatever it is before um, you get into a game situation, just to feel out what that's like um, and what your abilities are. And you may find out that, you know, you feel great or you may find that you need to put a little more time into strengthening and agility work before you hop into a game. Thanks, Megan. Um, I just want to share what I learned after an injury. Um, and just so, so uh, I was playing for about an hour and a half and somebody said, hey, let's play one more set, one more round. And I did, and I knew I was tired. 
and I knew I shouldn't have. And I had, I should back up for one second. Um, so two weeks before I pulled my hamstring and then I was all in, I said, oh, I'm feeling good. I'm gonna get out there, I'm gonna play again. And I played for a long time. And I unfortunately fell on the court and I tore a hamstring, mm -hmm. which took me out for several months, several months. So one, I wanna share, don't play when you're tired. And two, if you do have an injury, make sure you're ready to go back out with the floor. Don't, don't push, wait, wait for it, wait mm -hmm. for the right time. Yeah, that's a good okay. point. And actually brings up another um, good point is a lot of times when we train or when we practice um, certain things, we do it when we're fresh. So when we're not tired, um, but actually it's beneficial to also practice when you when you are a little fatigued, so that way if you get into that position, um, it's not the first time that you've been um, doing certain things when you're tired. Um, so to build the stamina. So sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes folks will lift weights before they do a specific activity. Sometimes they'll do it after, um, just to make sure that you're training in that fatigued state as well. But you don't want to be fatigued to the point where your form is bad. That is absolutely a stopping point. If you're tired and you can't you know, hold it together with your form or you feel like you're off balance or it's just been too much, obviously don't push through and then try to do some skills work there. Um, so thank you for reminding me of that. Um, quick question. Um, I'm looking for a new paddle soon and I'm prone to tennis elbow. Mm -hmm. Is it, am I assuming correctly that if you have a lighter paddle, it's less stress on your elbow? In theory, yes, there are a lot of um, studies going on right now about that. Um, but I, for me, I think most of it comes down to grip. So if you're really gripping your paddle hard, you're over engaging all of these muscles um, around your elbow. So I think working on a lighter grip um, with your paddle can, regardless of the weight, I mean, to me, it makes sense that if you have a heavier paddle, you may have to grip it a little harder mm -hmm. to feel like you have control over it. Um, the other thing I've been reading about is um, sometimes folks put a larger handle on their paddle. I've read good things, and I've also read that sometimes it actually makes you grip harder. So I can't say for or against that. Um, you know, maybe it's something that you wanted to try, you just see how you respond to having a wider grip versus not. Um, but yeah, I think if you can just, no matter what weight paddle, just a lighter grip, um, it takes a lot of practice to do that though. Did you injure your back? Did it feel like the things? Well, it's just a state of strain. When, how soon can you, should you start stretching? And what do you do about that? How do you handle that? Well, my personal philosophy is um, to always incorporate movement. Um, there are very few conditions where I would tell someone not to move. Um, so I think gentle stretching in most I mean, speaking generally is good. You don't want to, you know, injure your back and then be still for a week or two um, because that allows all your muscles to get tight um, and it'll make it harder um, to get the mobility back that you need to do whatever it is that you want to do. So I'd say gentle stretching, um, maybe not immediately, but, you know, same day as an injury, but pretty soon after, just making sure you stay mobile within your tolerance is important, but again, everyone's different. So it depends, you know, what your mechanism of injury was. Um, but if it was, you know, you have a strain from lifting or pushing or pulling, I'd say, you know, definitely to your tolerance as soon as you can get some gentle stretching and then progress it from there. My wife broke her foot playing peek a hole. Mm. I'm using crutches here. How long usually it takes for recovery time before you can actually go and try to play after uh, fracture? Oh, that's a tough one. It depends where the fracture is and um, the extent of the fracture um, and how quickly your bones heal. So everyone heals a little differently. I would assume that um, the fracture would probably be monitored with um, repeated x-rays to see how well it's healing. Um, and then from there, it's just a gradual progression back to activity, but that would be something that would be very specific to um, where and um, the extent of the fracture.
So the idea of fatigue is big. I know like other sports like skiing, it's huge. Um, what percentage of people injured themselves in that last one more? Um, <clears throat> I presume that like a full muscle in your calf would also be the same thing, keep it mobile, but monitor it. Because I've, I've tried to wait like three or four weeks of time and then I re-injured myself because it's too early. There's probably no no rule for which body part you hurt and how long to wait. It's just, I guess, as we get older, it's, it's longer. And thirdly, are there any, I remember when we started rollerblading, you had wrist protectors and, and all this kind of things. You don't anticipate falling into the wall, but do you see the emergence of any of these sort of protective gear? Oh yeah, I'm sure it's all out there. I mean, I've seen some, you know, different braces and things. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah, we won't have to be fit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that will be for your mobility, though. Yeah. So that's always my concern with any sort of brace um, is that if you're limiting your mobility somewhere, you have to make up for it somewhere else. Um, and also, if you limit the mobility of a joint, um, you're not using your muscles the same way, so you can lose strength that way too. Um, but you know, there are some situations where wearing a brace, at least for a short time, is beneficial. You have a really unstable ankle you probably should be playing pickleball but if you are maybe you want to put an ankle brace on just for the short term to give you a little stability there um but definitely um i'm not on board with getting a brace for a condition and wearing it until the end of time um if you're doing that then you're not doing the the work that you need to do to get rid of it um so um well, yeah. you already said it but what's the most common I think the most common, and I don't know for sure, I would say it's probably um, an ankle sprain. Um, just the the nature of, you know, moving back and forth quickly. Um, I think that would probably be it. You know, runner up would probably be tendonitis of probably your elbow. Um, but yeah, I'm not really, I don't have um, definitive, um, but that's a lot of what I see. And then, you know, like a strain or Rupture of the Achilles. I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but you don't recommend to run backwards, right? Yeah, I you know I know in the game it happens. I'm guilty of it. Um, it's not. It's your body isn't really. Um, it's not an ideal movement for sure. Um, you know, I mean, from what I've learned in pickleball, you're supposed to kind of turn like run in like a half circle to get back to the, the you know. If a ball comes over your head, do I ever do that? No. <laughs> um, but also, if I feel that I'm not in an ideal place to bring myself back, I'm you know I'm not playing for you know my livelihood, so I'll just let the ball land wherever it's going to land, and I'll go on with my my day. Um, so you know, it, it, I like to take it, yeah. You know, I, I'm a very casual player, so I don't really care. You know, a point is behind me and I, you know, haven't fallen and broken some legs. A win. Okay. Okay. Try to tell them running back. It's like, I'll never fall running back. It's, I think they're all crazy for saying I thought they wanted to make it. I guess the first thing I was called. So. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if it's something that you realize you're doing a lot in your game and maybe it's something you can and can't change, practice. You know, I mean, I wouldn't practice full speed, just like feel what it's like to move backward. You'll probably feel pretty awkward doing it. It's um, it's a pretty awkward movement. Um, so yes, if you can totally avoid it, great. If you just feel that you keep falling into that trap of doing it, at least get your body used to it. Yes. Is there anything else for the ankle besides the jumping side to side to prepare it? Yeah, so your lateral lunges. Um, your heel raises will get some good uh, mobility and blood flow there. Um, and then, yeah, the, the lateral glides are great to do that. Um, you know, if you, if you have an ankle injury, maybe you, um, do more ankle specific stuff like ankle circles, or you can kind of trace the alphabet with your foot, something like that, just to make sure that you're nice and loose that way. Um, and then. Um, you know, if ankle stability is an issue, um, there are plenty of strengthening exercises you can do with um, like resistance bands and things like that. But from a warm-up perspective, I think those lateral movements combined with the heel raises is a pretty good way to get you ready to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I just want to offer something I learned in rehab to practice back, walking backwards, do it in a swimming pool. Yeah, that makes sense. You're in the water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you. So thank you for coming.